Okay, um, uh, just a quick introduction of myself. Uh, I consider myself a, a coach's son. My dad was a head basketball coach for 44 years, 47 years in coaching altogether. He, uh, his heart and soul went into it. Uh, for most of my life, I've been a three-sport coach. I've been a head basketball coach throughout the 1980s for nine years. Uh, chemistry teacher, I'm a writer. And I was gonna to mention too, I have, uh, it's actually a three generation thing. I have two sons. They're very good coaches of football and track. This presentation really has nothing to do with track and field. Uh, obviously track and field uh, is, you know, I think the central focus of track and field is speed. So obviously it shares that. But really what I'm gonna to do today is talk the way I would talk to Dre Brown, who's pictured here. Dre led the Big Ten in, in returns this year. He's trying to get a tryout with an NFL team, possibly even go in the seventh round. And um, Dre sat in my, uh, my living room for two hours and I consulted with him. And I actually showed him some Brian Kula videos as well that were very much impressed him and all that. So basically what I'm gonna be telling you guys is the same thing I told Dre Brown or J.Q. Cossier, who, uh, who's down in Louisiana, whose dad is training him to get faster. He's 10 years old and he's looking really good in this picture. Or uh, Jordan Chapman, who is playing a professional ball in Europe right now. It's interesting, Jordan, when he got a hold of me, he said that he had lost his athleticism, that it was, he could hardly dunk anymore. Um, he was a typical uh, grinder basketball player. He was actually playing basketball six or seven hours a day and was doing no training for speed or for plyometrics and all that stuff. So anyway, I remotely trained Jordan. But probably the key guy um, is this guy I've never met. He plays for a uh, uh, school outside of Philadelphia, LaSalle Prep. And he's just a, I love this guy because he's a hardworking, generic white kid. You know, he's like 5'9", 175. Um, he had a good junior year, not a great junior year. He's one of those typical slot receivers, and he's never run track. And he said, I want you to train me. That's not really what I love to do. Um, I'm really a head track coach, uh, you know, first and foremost. But uh, something about this kid really intrigued me. So everything I talk about is kind of like what I'm saying to this guy on the phone or uh, messaging and all that kind of stuff. So I think you first need to know some how to cook stuff. Um, and I'll get into this feed the cats idea. Um, when I was in high school in the late, in the mid to late seventies, um, my coach used to say, I'm going to call you the dragons because I'm going to run you to your ass is dragon. And he meant it. This was, this was the old school approach. This was, uh, we're, we're going to outwork everybody effort is everything that we're going to make people tougher by making them tired. And you say, well, that was 50 years ago. What the hell? I mean, it's not like that anymore. Well, BJ Stevens runs for Purdue. And I'd say it's pretty much the same damn thing for him. And this is the type of stuff that I fight against every day because I really believe if you hate track five days a week or six days a week here, um, you're not going to be as good as you should be that we're really good at what we like and we are obsessively good at what we love. So what Feed the Cats is all about is my realization in 1999, even though I had, I'd won a state championship, I'd had reasonable, you know, very good success, but still track sucked. And I finally just said it, you know, and just said, and one of the reasons I said it, because my son, Alec, who was a, could dunk a basketball in the eighth grade, told me he's going to play baseball in high school. And I could hardly stomach that, you know, you know, he said, dad, everybody knows track sucks. And so what I wanted to do is start to attract fast twitch athletes, good athletes to my track program without begging them to come out. And I did it with, through a micro dosing of sprinting and jumping. Um, I bragged that we're not going to run anymore. We're just going to sprint, um, that, uh, you'll be out of practice within 45 minutes and you'll feel better leaving practice than you felt when you came to practice. So that was kind of the cornerstone, the epiphany, the, the, you know, the watershed moment of when everything changed for me. And what happened was pretty incredible. Um, in this next six years, we dominated the four by one at the state meet, um, setting us two state records. We, we won the four by one at the state meet four out of the next six years. Um, that even though I, everything I was doing was just a, 
I'm almost embarrassed to say it, just trying to attract good athletes to my team, knowing that good athletes make a very good track team. Um, what I found out through Record, Rank, and Publish was that everyone was getting faster with these methods, that somehow I just stumbled into a way to train sprinters that I wasn't even trying to be good at what we do. I, we just, I, I just wanted to make it more fun, and it worked. So how do you feed the cats? Well, first of all, you got to keep your kids happy and healthy. These things, I, I think I gloss over this too fast, but but we are uh, happy people are really good at what they do. And healthy people are really good too. I, I don't know if there's anything more important in life than to be happy and healthy. I think you have to keep the main thing, the main thing. But here, here's the, everybody says, of course you do. The main thing, the main thing. But here's my take on it. And that is that a lot of people can't tell me the main thing. Uh, we have too many priorities. I, I love the statement in the uh, Essentialism book that when we have too many priorities, we drown in shallow water. And I think that that's the typical parent, the typical coach, the typical human. Yeah, we well, don't want to drown in shallow waters. You want to prioritize things. So the main thing is max speed. And, and when I say max speed, we're not talking about acceleration. The main thing is max speed. Um, Stuart McMillan taught me three years ago, he hadn't taught me much, but, but he taught me three years ago that the guy who's running the fastest at the 60 meter mark always wins the hundred. Well, that tells me that you want to be the fastest guy out there. So everything else is secondary. And when I talk about acceleration, you say, well, football is an acceleration sport. The faster you get at max speed, the faster you get at acceleration. The opposite is not true. We can work on acceleration for 100 straight days and our max speed may get slower. So I believe that the main thing is max speed. My cats don't run. If you look at, at these cross country guys, none of them have that Carl Lewis pose. None of them. They don't have the 115 degree uh, spread of their femurs. Uh, they're, they're, there's nothing that resembles sprinting in this picture. And this is actually when they're running the fastest, you know, at the start of the race. I love this tweet that I put out three years ago. An undrafted guy from, from a nobody school, Minnesota State, um, was obviously a good college football player. But no, nobody knows anything about Minnesota State's wide receivers. So he felt like he needed to get noticed. And this is what I mean about main thing, the main thing priorities. He worked on nothing but speed until he could run a 4.45. And to me, the, uh, the average personal trainer, uh, not Brian Kula, but the average uh, personal trainer would be somebody that would have taken Adam in eight different directions. They'd be working on agility. They'd be working on uh, lifting on, I mean, it would be all these different things, bodybuilding. And and really, you really have to prioritize speed because it is, uh, in my opinion, the priority. Now, when you pro prioritize speed and you work on it consistently, things like this happen to you. Not often, but it happens to you. I was the freshman football coach. Um, I, we didn't lose a game for four consecutive years. Um, this kid played on my B team. Tyler Hoosman never carried the ball one time for my A team. Our A team played at 8.30 in the morning on Saturday mornings. Our B team played four quarters after the A game. So he, he probably carried the ball five, six times on the B team. And if by these times, I don't know if you're aware of 10-meter flies, but that is a true judge of max speed. And 1.37 is a speed that I, I think some middle-aged women could probably run. 1.37 is very, very slow. Even though he was a running back, he ranked 46th, 46th on my team in, uh, in speed. Uh, that's amazing because we only had like 63 guys, but ranked 46. But, you know, he, I, I got to train him in the summer before football. He played football for me. I trained him all winter. And then his dad made him go out for track where he was the slowest. He was ranked number 48 on my sprint team, um, 48 out of 48. He was my slowest sprinter as a freshman in my whole entire group but because of that year-round training and record rank and publish and making it a priority and stuff like that as you can see his times 
really improved. And, you know, now he's a college running back and doing, doing a great job for, for Northern Iowa. I think you need to know a little bit about dosage. And my favorite way to teach dosage is by talking about hormesis. Hormesis, uh, Paracelsus coined this term. It really is more about pharmaceuticals and things. But he said that everything is a poison. Nothing is a poison. It all depends on the dosage. Um, the story I always tell is two aspirin, good for a headache. A hundred aspirin kills you. So is aspirin good or bad? Well, it's both. Same way with training. Scholes uh, uh, went a step further 200 years ago, and he said for every substance, small doses stimulate, moderate doses inhibit, and large doses kill. I always think about alcohol when, I, when I'm looking at this, that, you know, after a beer or two, I'm a better man. After four or five, not so much. And, you know, after 10, you know, it's, it's you yeah, know, I wish I was dead. So, uh, so once again, that's, that's the way I think you should look at training is that you should look for that dosage that stimulates, not the dosage that, that hinders. We don't know where the hump is for any of our athletes. We don't know. Now the hump, my father used to call it the point of diminishing returns that after a certain amount of basketball practice, you weren't getting any good out of it anymore. And if you went way past that point of diminishing returns, you would end up actually becoming worse, that you'd practice for four hours, but your team is, is banged up and destroyed because you went too far. Well, since you don't know where that hump is for every player, you have to artistically try to always err on this side of not burning the stake, not going over that hump. And when you do that, of course, you remain injury free. You get, you know, just a little bit better every day. And that's, coaches all talk like that, but then they don't reflect that in their training. This is one of my, uh, I have a series of like weight room posters that I would like to make. Um, the only problem is none of them would sell. Um, but this is one of my favorite things, do less and achieve more. And this is really a speed training thing, but, but I practice this in the classroom. Um, I, I think we can all do this because see, when, 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 you, when we say, okay, think of a boxer, um, do you want the boxer hitting the heavy bag a thousand times or three sets of 20? Well, a thousand times, you're, you're not going to be uh, very focused, not very intense, not much force. But if you have three sets of 20, you automatically raise up the focus, the intent, and the force. Uh, the Los Angeles Dodgers last year set every franchise record in hitting, and the, the key thing to what they accomplished was limiting time in the batting cage. That if you tell a guy that's addicted to the batting cage, wanting to take 500 swings a day, that they only get 50. They automatically improve the quality of their swings. And I would argue that the quality of our work is much more important than the quantity. I mean, even bad coaches say that. And the, the only difference is bad coaches don't do it then. They, they don't, their practices don't reflect what they say. It's another one of my posters. Um, uh, the grind is in the antithesis of feed the cats. Um, that we are not trying to outwork people. I, I, I argued with somebody on, on Twitter today. Somebody was like saying, um, how many of you think that effort's the most important thing in sports? And I'm like, it's the most overrated thing in sports that a slow guy with high effort never wins the race ever. Um, a, a, a kid with great effort who can't shoot the fucking basketball doesn't even get a play. You know, we have to start emphasizing things that really matter and low information coaches always want to default to things like effort and let's outwork our opponents. And I'm the opposite. I do believe that we come by it honestly, that coaches are grinders by nature. We are 100% effort guys. We came early, stayed late. We fell in love with our coaches. This is just something that just inherent in coaching. And I think one of the problems I try to teach coaches who are grinders, that they have a hard time coaching the cats. Uh, they have a hard time coaching the guys that don't come early and stay late. And, you know, they're not doing 110 
you know, if, if somebody says, I want you to go do this or that, they're not doing more than expected. And, you know, they get pissed off at them and, and, and don't like them. But, you know, the Randy Moss types are kind of needed in, in our world. You have to get rid of all the, uh, the typical weight room posters. I make fun of these posters. Um, but, but this isn't funny to the ab average football coach or track coach because this was their religion coming up. And, and this is what, you know, what they latched on to. And, and this, so this is what they preach and teach and they put their posters in their weight room and in their bedroom and all that kind of stuff. And uh, this is the antithesis of Feed the Cats. This comes from the Great Stack article where I first learned of Brian Kula. Um, I believe it was uh, last summer. And um, I love this quote, the grind makes it difficult to train your most explosive muscle fibers. Charlie Francis said that athletes should never be sore from training. Now, a lot of people have a hard time with this. I believe that sometimes athletes will be unintentionally sore. That happens. You know, if you're not used to doing the things we do, yeah, you're going to be a little sore the next day. But for me, soreness should never be a goal of training. And you, you look at the, uh, the typical weight room meathead football coaching mentality is that if we are not hurting and sore, um, then we are not um, getting anything done. Uh, my son, Alec, uh, gives me hell because, uh, because he remembers me saying before my transition that, that athletes need to, get, uh, need to fall in love with the sore life, that, that we are going to be constantly, perpetually sore. We're always going to be sore, and that's how we get better. And uh, obviously, I'm embarrassed now um, for having said those dumb things. Uh, this is Ashton Eaton, uh, world champion decathlete. We want to get to the line 80% in shape and 100% healthy rather than the other way around. This is actually his coach, Harry Mara, who said this. And I, I believe this is one of my favorite quotes that, um, that if you flip that and you basically have the, the typical experience of most athletes where you are hard, I mean, you're, you're a product of extremely hard work pushing the boundaries of endurance and toughness and all that kind of stuff. So you're like hundred percent in shape, but you're only 80% healthy. And if you're 80% healthy, you will never be a hundred percent fast. Uh, as a matter of fact, unhealthy guys are just terrible, terrible athletes. I actually witnessed, uh, in my high school, we played the biggest game of the year. Um, and actually had 14 guys in jeans and uniforms on the sideline, 14 guys. And I thought to myself, these 14 guys did not survive the practice week. And I don't know if, I mean, obviously the coach is pissed that they're all hurt, but he was kind of pissed at them. And I was like pissed at him as the coach. Another one of my posters would be tired is the enemy, not the goal. Now, ironically, this is Ashton Eaton too. Now, Ashton Eaton um, it looks like this right now because he just finished the 10th event of the decathlon which is, of course, the 1,500 meters. And the reason why this event totally sucks for these guys is that they are terribly trained for this event, intentionally terribly trained, because any type of training in endurance is going to take away those explosive, fast muscle fibers like McCaffrey was talking about. So, so they have to go out and just gut it out for the 1500 because they still want to throw the shot. They still want to be able to jump and sprint and all those things. And they can't be going out training like a cross country guy in order to be good in the final event. Any fool can get another fool tired. Uh, I love to tell the story when I was head basketball coach back in, I think it was about 80, 1986. Uh, I had a stupid freshman football, or freshman basketball coach at the time. They had lost the night before. And I said, so what do you think your problem is, coach? He said, God damn it, we've missed 18 layups. That's the problem. I go, 18 layups. He goes, yep, we're not going to touch it. God damn ball today. We're just going to, we're going to run their asses off. We're, we're just going to run, run, run. And I said, well, maybe you should practice layups. You know, and I, I think that too often this is the stupid mentality, especially low information coaches, that the default is we're just – if we lose, we're going to double down and work harder than we've ever worked. 
Uh, speaking of, of coaches, that this is crazy stuff. Um, I actually met this coach at a clinic in Georgia, and we're good friends now. So, uh, but anyway, I, this is not feed the cats. Come on, man! Hurry up, man! One big push up, go! One great jump, go! Come on, man! Come on, Evan! One great push up, go! One great jump. Go! Hurry up, Evan! One great push-up! Go! I won't make you watch the entire two minutes and ten seconds of that, but um, but this is the kind of stuff that's interesting. The guy was proud of it, so he put it on uh, on Twitter, and uh, about 80% of the replies were positive. I mean, I, I, I think I said something about abuse, um, but the uh, 80% were like, you're turning boys into men, um, tough love, something he doesn't get at home. This was actually the kid's first summer track practice. And uh, who knows, maybe the kid became an All-American because, you know, the coach beat him into the ground. But this is not feed the cats. Never let today ruin tomorrow. Um, I always tell the story that my, my first practice, my junior year in football, was a three-hour practice where I came home beaten and battered, um, took a two-hour nap, and could barely get out of bed. And we had another night. And then we also had, we had 10 um, uh, double sessions that year. So I can only imagine how bad the, uh, um, how, how bad the performance was during those 10 days. But, you know, coaches just didn't care. They just want to work kids to death. Essentialism is another part of the cooking part. I'm going to get to the more specific things in a minute. Bear with me if you're getting bored. But I love this statement, the disciplined pursuit of less. We want to know how little we can do. The Pareto principle is huge to me. Uh, as a matter of fact, with Brian Kula, um, uh, the first time I met him, we sat down um, uh, that night and I asked him, what really matters? What is your 20%? I was really wanting to know 20% in the weight room. And, uh, and I think that we can learn a lot by just amplifying the stuff that works the best and then cut, cut out all the bullshit. You know, most, most practices fluff and stuff that we could get rid of. I believe when we put all of our energy in the same direction, we get further. Enough said. So how do you train a cat? Uh, it's one of my sayings, you sprint as fast as possible, as often as possible, staying as fresh as possible. Now, it's not just a, like a poetic saying or something, but fast as possible to me needs to be defined. That means spikes, that means timed, that means recorded, ranked, and published. All five of those things. If you're missing those things, it's very likely just going to be running. And running and sprinting are two different things. Now, how often, we'll talk about this later, but I think for super elite athletes, it may only be twice a week. Uh, for your typical high school good track athlete, I think three days a week. If you were working with a nine-year-old kid, you can sprint him every damn day because, because the central nervous system and the forces involved are so small in comparison with an elite athlete. But you need to uh, do it as often as possible. And then you've got to stay as fresh as possible. We'll talk about this too, that you never train speed tired, ever. You must find times. And that's hard to do with a lot of like summer athletes these days because they're tired all summer. And so uh, if that's the case, they're just not going to get faster. There's no way around it. So the only surefire way to increase speed is your sprint mechanics. We work on it daily. We'll talk about it. Uh, max speed sprinting which is about three times a week, and jumping. We jump a little bit every day, and we jump a lot more during our X-Factor workouts, and we'll talk about that. Now, the one thing that's not up here is, um, is weightlifting, uh, because I don't think there's, uh, there's anything that I see in the weight room, um, anything, that I could say, give me your top four guys in this lift, and they're going to be our four by one team. I can just not draw that line. I'm, we'll talk about lifting later. I'm not anti lifting. I just don't think that it's a surefire way to increase speed. 
this is, you know, like every business guy, every parent, every coach, uh, they just want to go in all directions and they are confused about which one of these arrows is the main arrow or the important arrow. Uh, obviously, I'm trying to get you to prioritize now. Essentialism is not about how to get more things done. It's about how to get the right things done. Everybody shakes their head. Sure, sure, I got this. And But then the thing that really takes, it's taken me 39 years and I'm still working on it, is what exactly are the right things? Um, that is evolving all the time with me. And I'm 61 years old. This is the way I see my speed training ideas. We are going in the same freaking direction. We're going to pound that post of speed. Um, we, we don't have different phases of our training where we focus on, on things, priorities other than getting real fast. We just want to get really fast all the time. I do make simple graphs and, you know, uh, everybody talks about how important it is to be simple and all that. And then they're complex as hell. You know, once again, where, where people agree with these things, but then they don't do it. Uh, some vectors here, I believe in you know, my two types of workouts uh, to improve speed or speed workouts and X factor workouts. I believe if you do the, these two things, um, you get faster. Now, if you're doing some things that work on speed and some things that work on endurance and, and hard work, I think you counterbalance those speed gains. You end up going nowhere. And I think, you know, the, the atypical type of training is the arrows going in the same direction. The more typical training is the one at the bottom where the speed is going to stay the same. Um, uh, the saying that goes along with the bottom one is the Russian saying that um, if you chase two rabbits, you'll catch none. So, you know, the idea is obviously, of course, you know, just try to catch one damn rabbit. But now we're into the specific stuff. We're going to talk about speed days and X factor days. Now, I, I do want to make note, remember, I'm talking to the kid, Liam Kennedy from the Sal Prep outside of Philadelphia, who's never run track. We are not going to train him as a 400 meter runner. So I'm not going to talk any at all about any type of lactate workouts that are the key to running the 400 as a sprinter. Instead, I'm going to talk about just stuff that improves speed. So my goal would be three speed days per week. So let's talk about what speed days are. We don't stretch. We don't warm up. By the way, no one gets injured. Uh, people say, well, gee, if you don't warm up, you get right into speed drills. Yep. You know, how, how many guys get injured doing that? Well, in the last 21 years, zero. Never been a single injury doing intense speed drills to start practice. Um, this year, uh, we've been doing RPR for six years, but it was always me working on my best sprinters for performance at a meet. This year is the first time we've put it into our warm up and it really worked well. I was really proud of it. Obviously, our season ended way too early, but, uh, but this is about 90 seconds. Matter of fact, I probably need to talk about this in a webinar sometime. This is about 90, 90 seconds of our warm up. And I think we can get a lot done in those 90 seconds. We do 10 speed drills, and these speed drills are not anything special. Um, uh, pretty much, I mean, every soccer team in America does things like high knees and A skips and things like that. But we fast march. I think fast march is the most underrated thing in the world. And it's a great thing to start with. And the first three things are all just picking up your damn knee, but they all three have a different, um, different rhythm to it. Like fast march is like, and then high knees is, 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 um, is more like real fast fast frequency, and then A skips have that. Then we go to a plyo. Now, a lot of people don't think that's really a speed drill. When I say speed drills, these are just things we do. And by the way, this does serve as our warm up. And by the way, this is exactly what my guys do before the four by one. They go through the same stuff. Um, but we do box jumps, which are just like tuck jumps. Um, we do, uh, we, we bound, we bound every day. How much do we bound? 40 meters, you know, like eight bounds or something like that. Um, we love the straight legged bounds that we call prime times. We, we do that twice. We do a 
by the way, when we do straight legged bounds, we really race and try to go fast when we do it. We butt kick and reach, which is a retro sprint. You know, like we just go really, really fast. Um, and then I think really important, we do one thing that we try to get up to top speed in. We're not spiked up yet, but, but the very last thing we do, we do a split and rip, push, push, push to get out of our stance. And people are always wanting to know how much rest we have in between these things. Hell, just enough, you know, like 20, 30 seconds. Um, this whole thing takes about 10 minutes, 12 minutes. And then we do three sprints. Typically, we do 40s. I love 40s because the connection we get with football players, uh, we want football players to want to be on the track team. So if we make 40s, the cornerstone, the, the key thing, our key metric and all that stuff, they're going to love it. And the 40 is a wonderful uh, thing because I always say like half the 40 is acceleration and the other half is max speed. So you're working on the only two things that matter in, in speed, and that's getting up to top speed and then top speed. Um, the best, I love 10 meter flies because remember that how fast you can go is the key thing. And the 10 meter fly, there are sometimes some guys who are fast in the 40 that are not great track athletes, but there's never ever anyone that's super fast in the 10 meter fly. There's never, never a, po a false positive in the 10 meter fly ever. If a guy can run 24 miles an hour, he is freaking on my four by one team. I don't have, there's a matter of fact, he's going to win state medals because 24 miles an hour is really freaky fast. So once again, let's define sprinting, spiked up, timed, recorded, ranked, and published. Um, guys need five minutes recovery between sprints and that's for getting the ATP all going again. After about two minutes, they're going to feel pretty good, good enough to run it again, but then they'll run a really slow ass time. And the reason why they run a slow ass time is because they have not replenished their ATPs yet. So it's important that you give them about five minutes, but I don't even talk about it because my kids know how long they need to wait in between. The total time of a workout with a small group would be about 30 minutes. Obviously, if you're timing 45 kids, then yeah, if you have 45 kids, you're probably going to be 45 minutes or 50. But, uh, but yeah, practices are very short. Now let's talk. Now, one of the bad things about the webinar, and I, I, hope, I hope this thing works well. I got really good videos here, and it, they may look choppy. I hope that you can see them well enough to at least understand what we're talking about. So this is one of the things we do in our speed drills, prime times where we try to go really fast, straight legs. Um, we do box jumps and that's just like tuck jumps where we have invisible boxes. And by the way, if you get somebody that jumps like this, he's going to be an all stater. I mean, because there's certain surefire things like, I truly believe I can pick my four by one by watching a kid do this because the kids that can jump like this are always fast. This is uh, okay. These, this kid's going to be doing some uh, box jumps, but also some single legs. I think it's important to note that this kid did not. Okay. He did not make his basketball team as a freshman and never played basketball in high school. Um, he never got to play as a freshman in football. He ran like a 56 in the 400 as a freshman. My point being that kids will not come into your program looking like this, that especially in the single leg stuff, the single leg stuff is just crazy. I have no idea why it's so choppy, but believe me, he can really do it. So this is a picture of a good bound. Once again, this guy, anybody that can bound like this is going to be pretty good. Here's just an acceleration at top speed. We accelerate every day. Now, I want to show just the two cues that we use in this. I think it's kind of important. Come on. Okay. The, the split and rip cue. Okay. Here is we want everybody, and everybody can do this. This is our split. By split, we're talking about the hands are split here. We're posting up strong. 
and then we want to push, push, push. That's our other cue. So there's a push. There is a push. This is Marcellus Moore when he was a freshman. He was pretty good then, too. He's the best 14 year old in the history of the world. Um, I heard this at a at a place down in Nashville 18 years ago. I still remember it, um, where a trainer told me anything lasting more than five seconds is not speed training. You are no longer working on speed. It may be beneficial for you to do a 23 second run, but it's not going to be beneficial for speed to do that. Now to measure max speed, you'd need a free lap system. Um, my free lap system, I believe I have 25 chips and that's easily enough. We share chips. Um, my entire, everything I have, I, I think, no, I think about 11 chip. you can get 11 chips, a couple more maybe. Um, and I have the full system for less than 3000. That sounds like a lot of money, but you just need to sell it to your booster club. You know, your booster club needs to buy this. They buy so much crap, you know, like smoke machines and things for your football program. This is something that can help every kid. In, in my opinion, uh, a weight room without a free lap system is, is a joke. You know, that speed is actually more important to me than strength. So why, why wouldn't you have a free lap system when you paid $100,000 for a weight room? Now, to Liam Kennedy, the high school kid that I train remotely, um, he and his dad went out and bought this. And it's a hell of a deal. It's just don't use the push button thing. That's a pain in the ass. Um, but use the two cones, one chip, 659 bucks. So, so Liam is timing himself all the time with this. Um, you know, what a great investment. When you see what parents invest into their kids with like baseball crap and stuff, thousands and thousands of dollars, uh, 659 is a pretty good investment. He loves it. So this is, this is what I mean by we time solo. Uh, here, Marcellus is going to run the 40 yard dash and I'm going to be hand timing him doing that. And then we're going to use free lap to time the final 10 meter fly of that 40. So I'm going to get two different, uh, two different metrics in one run. You see me down there sitting in a chair. That's how I coach. You know, I just sit around and, you know, I yell out the time to him. I yell out his 40 time. I yell out his 10 meter fly time. By the way, he has a school record in both handheld 40, 4.16, uh, 10 meter fly school record is 0 0.92. This is one of the fun things we do. Uh, now, obviously, if you're training alone, you can't get this done, but we run through a gauntlet of our teammates um, where they're clapping and cheering for you. I started doing this in eight years ago, and it was the craziest thing. I kept track, obviously, I record everything. But we had 61% of our athletes do it, run a personal record um, when we did the gauntlet. And so we've done it twice a year ever since. And with this twice a year thing, it's always right around 60%, which tells me that um, <laughs> there's something untapped that in kids that we need to uh, push that button once in a while. So anyway, this is what it looks like. He probably had more fun in that four second run than I had in uh, 10 years of track and field. I, we do this, actually, this is the only competitive thing we do. Um, I, I love the idea. We do a 20 yard competition fly. And I really thought I was maybe onto something like this would be like the other gauntlet like thing where, oh my God, you know, all of our times, uh, these records, we saw no difference at all. The miles per hour with these guys were exactly the same as they do when they run solo. So what I found is that the competition element did absolutely nothing to improve times. These two sophomore sprinters of mine that are going to be pretty good someday. Uh, 
Um, this is Liam Kennedy. Um, this is the guy that I'm training. And for a non-track athlete, he's really, really good. Um, he, uh, um, he's, he was running typically when we first bought the free lap about six weeks ago or two months ago, he was running usually around 103, but a lot of 104s and 105s is like the best time of the day. And um, just the other day, he ran 097, which is 23 miles an hour. If you're 23 miles an hour, you, you, you might be able to walk on somewhere and, and, and play some big time football because 23 miles an hour is really, really good. I love his, uh, his running form. I hope that wasn't all choppy because he looks really good to me. Uh, this is an interesting thing we started this year. I bought 1,200 wristbands, uh, 400 of, no, 300 of each of these, 20 mile an hour, 21, 22, and 23. If you take the 10 meter fly time, you can go 22.37 divided by the 10 meter fly time and you get miles per hour. And uh, it's an easy way. Um, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of uh, uh, college coaches that are doing that now. I think it's a, it's a, it's a great thing. My, my track team was really young this year. And of course, Marcel's graduated early and went to Purdue. Um, but after about three weeks of track, we'd have, we had one kid in the 23 mile an hour club. We had five in the 22. I think we had about 15 in the 21 mile an hour club. And I think, let's see, I'm trying to think, like 32 out of my 38 sprinters were 20 mile an hour. And, and not every single kid would wear these bands to school. And not, I mean, I, I would look on their wrists and they would always be wearing these bands. I think it's just a really cool thing. Okay, one of the things I talk to Liam about all the time is that I'm worried he's going to get bored and quit. And we can't get bored of doing the fundamental things. If <laughs> it drives me nuts watching basketball teams practice and they do, do no focused shooting, the most important fundamental, and they don't do any of it. Um, or, or I watch a baseball team practice and uh, baseball is actually pretty good about because they spend time in the batting cage. You cannot get bored with the things that matter. So John Wooden said this, we need to explain something. And then we demonstrate it. And then we let them imitate what they just saw happen. And then they have to repeat it and repeat it and repeat it and repeat it and repeat it. So those are John Wooden's eight laws of learning. Um, I've been talking about this for 20 years, um, that we cannot get bored with the things. And I say this because speed days, I mean, bore me to death. Now, once I start seeing the times, I get excited, you know, but, but speed days is when I need that extra dose of caffeine before practice. So let's talk about X factor days. X factor is stuff that's short in duration, high in intensity. I would like to think it's maximum intensity work. Tired is the enemy, not the goal. This is an overarching thing for us that we, we want to make sure that somebody is not half-assing it during some plyometric because we hurried them too much. X-factor drills are things that we have a reasonable hunch that the X and explosiveness. I like to say this because sometimes the, you know, uh, some things that we do really might not, you know, like somebody say, well, why do you do that? And I may not have a great answer. It just looks good to me. You know, I have a reasonable hunch. Um, you know, sometimes, even though I taught science for 38 years, I'm kind of folksy in, um, in what I do. And I can see, like, the things that Brian Kula does with McCaffrey. And I can see things that I don't do. But I'm still like, hell yeah, that's X-Factor stuff. That's good stuff. I like that. So it's just kind of passes the eye test for me. And we're going to see those things here in a minute. Uh, microdose. Uh, strength, agility, hip mobility, plyometrics, wickets, new stuff. Stuff I saw on Twitter last night. We want to do no harm. We want to make sure, this is one of the biggest things is X-Factor days are almost like recovery days for us. That we want to set up the speed day the next day. We feel like uh, we should do something on that day, but we shouldn't sprint every day. X-Factor is actually an alternative to an off day. 
I'm not so sure sometimes it wouldn't be a great way to speed train by just going Monday speed, Wednesday speed, Friday speed, and do nothing else. The other four, five, four days are off. But as you know, as a coach, you're kind of expected to do something after school every day. So if you can't take Tuesday off, what do you do? You do an X factor day. You need to have enough recovery to repeat at the same intensity. X factor satisfies the need to constantly vary the exercise and training routine if you want maximum results. Okay, this goes back to the old strength and conditioning or textbook thing that if kids are not given new stimuli, they will never adapt to anything new and they'll stay the same. So I think you gotta be careful. I think you need to repeat the things that need repeating. What's that? Sprinting. Sprinting is the repetitive thing. X factor is the non-repetitive thing. X factor is the, uh, we call it X factor because X stands for unknown. We, we want things to be new and fresh and different. And obviously we'll repeat certain things often in our X factor work, but this is when we try stuff. Charlie Francis actually did tempo running on non-sprint days. And I could not disagree more. Um, I, I just don't understand why you would ever want to submax run in order to recover or set up a new sprint day. Um, yeah, we just, I think running confuses the nervous system of a sprinter. So we do X factor instead. And it's worked for us. Now, here's the question that we got. And this is a really smart question. Doesn't X factor overload the CNS? And the reason it doesn't is because 90% of the time we're just standing around watching somebody do something. It is like, it, it's almost embarrassing um, that, you know, like if some administrator came in, they would be very disappointed that I was not keeping everybody busy. You know, and we had this thing that, you know, if we're not running between drills and football practice, that somehow you're a bad coach. When what I would be looking for in a great football coach is not running between drills, if the drills are important, which they better be, or you shouldn't be doing them, you need to do them at 100% intensity. To be able to do things at 100% intensity, you have to loiter in between reps. So you do not want constant movement. Microdosing is gonna be the key to everything we do. All right, so let's hope the videos work um, um, and they're not all choppy, but these are things we do. Uh, have you seen us do box jumps? Remember that, um, all five of these guys are either all staters or all Americans or going to be, um, and you can tell by the way they box jump, you know, that, that this is just stuff that good athletes can do. And I guarantee it that these guys did not look like this when they were freshmen. We do four different types of lunges. Uh, we do lunge pop-ups. This is where we get a little pop at the top. We do long lunges, just the way it sounds, we, where we try to get a big split in our thighs. We do rocket lunges, where we try to bring the knee through like a rocket, like, like bang, really a fast knee coming through. And then we do reverse lunges. And so like a next factor workout, we'll do all four of those things. Okay, uh, my, my good friend, Rob Assisi, uh, wrote an article, One Man's Dive in the Extreme Isometrics. Um, he dropped a few F-bombs, so he wrote it under the name OG Static Work. But anyway, he gets into this stance for about five minutes. It's, um, it has magical things that happen um, when you get into this extreme lunge uh, position. Uh, this stuff is coming from Jay Schrader, the coach Archuleta. Um, if you can get into an extreme position, what they found is that you strengthen all the other positions. And the great thing about this is that in extreme ISOs, uh, there's no soreness the next day because we only get soreness from eccentric stuff, not from concentric and not from isometric. So he gets, in, if you notice his heels off the ground, um, it's a, try this sometime, try to get in this stance for five minutes and you'll start hallucinating after about one minute. You'll get the shakes real bad. It's crazy cool stuff. Now, usually in X-Factor stuff, we'll do this for 30 seconds or 40 seconds each leg. But this is just the, some of the crazy stuff we'll do. 
uh, Russian lunges where we bounce, 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 and explode. Bounce, bounce, bounce. Sorry, it's slow motion. Everything looks better in slow motion. So allow myself is so we bounce three times, explode upward. Now dosages, people say, well, how many of these you do? We'll say, do three left, three right. You know, like six all together. And we just do one, one set of these. We would never try to get sore by doing them. Uh, we do funky stuff. Here, my hurdle coach uh, has everybody doing star jumps. You can tell we have fun doing it. You see how many of those you do? So maybe like three sets of five or something like that, or two sets of five. Here's oscillatory booms. I learned this from Cal Dietz, Minnesota, through Chris Corfist. These are kind of cool. And anyway, we'll do like, I think Marcel's doing it here. He probably did this twice. Boom, boom, boom. Boom, boom, boom. Boom, boom, boom. Boom, boom, boom. Just groups of three, therabands. Uh, death jumps. Um, sometimes these are called hurdle hops, where we're going to step off. We use these bleachers all the time. Um, we step off and then we jump over a hurdle, sometimes two hurdles. USC will jump over like five hurdles. I have a reasonable hunch that this is good for explosive stuff, for speed stuff. Assisted plyos, this is something I developed four years ago, maybe. And uh, I think it's kind of swept the country. Um, and uh, I've even heard reports back that it might have some real potentiation effects on speed, where if you do these uh, and then time 40s right afterwards, you might have a bunch of personal records. Ha. He's a big basketball player. He's 6'5". But he's going to use the walker as... Um, somebody's going to push against to go higher. So he's going to absorb a lot more force than he's used to. People have asked me, should his feet be dorsiflex? And yeah, probably. They probably should. Uh, I believe that basketball players are my most durable athletes. And so we even do some lateral things in X Factor because I think lateral things uh, improve overall athleticism and durability. Here we have guy's going laterally his force is not just forward uh, see once again i have a reasonable hunch that this is good for us you know i it passes my eye test and if it's not good for us the dosage is so low it's not going to do any harm like okay this is something i just invented this year uh, uh, we're going to jump diagonally over a line we're going to race You know, what does that do for speed? I have no idea. We just tried it one day and, you know, it seemed like something that, you know, would pass the CNN, a CNS test. Um, I've never used jump ropes, for example, in X Factor, but I think jump ropes would be great. Uh, however, it wouldn't be like a five minute jump rope. It would be maybe a 20 second, you know, speedy jump rope session, good rest, another one, good rest, another one. I think jump rope is great. I'm just kind of lazy. I don't like gadgets and stuff. Here we're doing boom, boom, booms. Boom, boom, boom. And pause. Boom, boom, boom. Pause. Boom, boom, boom. Pause. Now, how long do we go until they start to get a little bit tired? Because tired is the enemy. Uh, sometimes we invent stuff. Um, try this with your guy sometimes. It, it, it will not be pretty the first time you do it. Uh, pogo jumps, uh, Corfus calls them toe pops. This kid's only like five, six, but he was an all-stater for us because he had such great bounce. Um, guys that are slow typically can't, can't do this. Uh, what's the dosage? 
uh, we'll probably do uh, one of one set for height and one set for length and just be done. Bosch drills, we're going to go um, kind of parallel to the ground, a little bit of a knee bend. We're, our hands are going to be next to our, um, our straight leg. And you can use weights or an aqua bag. We're just going to go with our hands here. We're going to get real tall. We're going to come off the big toe. Real tall coming off the big toe. I did this with an NFL running back, and we put 20-pound weights, 20-pound dumbbells in both hands. And he threw them up in the air like it was nothing. If you see the guys really coming off that big toe, we also don't just stomp on the first bleacher. We, we come real high and then let the bleacher kind of come to us. We kind of fall into that bleacher. This is something I learned from Carol Gilbert Smith from USC. You need to make sure you keep your shin back on this or else you'll ra rake your shin. This is a little bit too slow motion. I apologize in advance. We're going to throw our hands up and we're going to jump off that front leg. Then we're going to come down and we're going to do it again. Obviously, we do like five of them left leg, five of them right leg. I apologize for the super slow motion, but I like these. Okay, wickets are probably the most important thing we do um, on X Factor days, and it's probably just one day a week. Here we are laying the wickets down. The wickets are six feet apart. This is not acceleration wickets. These are high-speed wickets. We are not in spikes, so we technically don't call this a sprint thing. We call it an X-factor thing. Uh, we are, if you see the guys back in line, they're probably 20 meters away, and they're going to get to top speed in order to go over these. Our cues are big in the front, like a Carl Lewis-type pose, and short in the back. In other words, don't have any dangling um, stuff behind you. And uh, we go through these seven times. The first one is full arms. Okay, that was the full arms. The second one, now it's important, before his hands go high, he's going to be totally sprinting in, you know, like normal arms, 20 meters, and then his hands are going to go high. Why do we do funky things with our upper body? Why do we separate our upper body, lower body? It is my belief that when we do this, we develop better neural pathways between our brain and our lower body. And I think that's important. Once again, you know, I, well, Corfus will always tell me that th this also is really, really good for your lateral sling. Um, so, you know, that's another thing I could say. So that's hands high. Now we go airplane, sprint in, airplane. And then we do uh, sprint in again. You see the guys in the back. So it's a real big sprint. And then you put up your pistol right before you get there. If you note, I have the, uh, the hurdles actually laying down. I thought I was the only guy in the world who did this because I get pissed off when people when, when your worst sprinter mows them all down and, and everybody laughs. But I, I noticed that Vince Anderson also liked to lay them down. You can use things like yardsticks, slats, anything like that. They will go over it like it's an obstacle. So now we do hugs. And then our, this is our sixth one now, raise the roof, we sprint in. And then our last one, we put the arms back in. And I believe it looks vastly improved and it just looks really good to me. This is our seventh one, full arms. Once again, it's a total sprint. Now, it, it, sometimes we move into five feet and that's more like a piston action of your, it's not a full sprint in. Um, I've actually gone seven feet before, but you have to spike up. If you go seven feet, you have to spike up because the only way you, you develop that distance in your stride, your stride length is by getting real fast. You don't, you don't ever want kids to reach. So they have to be really fast to go over seven foot wickets. 
Um, this is actually a still frame from what we're doing. And this shows that great split of the femur. You know, I don't know if it's 115 degrees, but it's a really good split. And if you bisect the angle, the arrow should end up underneath that lead foot. I love the fact that his lead foot is under his knee. I don't know why, but a lot of kids like to tuck that foot back under their hip. And I hate that. I, you know, we constantly talk about foot out in front of the body. Here's my three-year-old grandson, Kendrick, um, going over with absolutely perfect form. So, you know, this is something that, um, that I guess is natural. Uh, if you want to change something, measure it. Uh, measuring stuff will change the way things. If I say, okay, I want, we're going to bound, everybody would bound. But if I say we're going to measure six bounds, watch what happens. Yeah, when you take cats and you say we're going to measure it or time it, you change what you're doing. I mean, it's, it's just absolutely fantastic. I mean, I, this passes the eye test for me. This is good for kids. And 53 is not fantastic, by the way. He's not a triple jumper or anything. He's just a big, powerful kid. Uh, we can measure single leg bounds. Try this one. We're actually going single leg and we're competing. Both these guys actually did 46 feet doing. Now notice that on both of these things, I got this from USC as well. We're starting from a two-footed um, start on the line, and then we're measuring out. It's not a race, so one guy started a little bit earlier than the other, but, but this is single leg. One guy's doing his right leg, one guy's doing his left. But both guys did 46 feet. I don't know if that's good or bad. I know that this looks good, though, to me. And I know that in, if we were measuring it, we would not see the same stuff. Sometimes we do weird stuff. We love to put our hands above our head for some reason. Once again, separating lower body, upper body. Go. Try this sometimes. This is not easy. This kid was going to have a breakout year for me in the hurdles this year as a junior. So sad. Not as sad as if he's a senior, I guess. Once again, this does not happen naturally. This, this has to be worked on. And your freshmen will just piss you off. They're, they're gonna be terrible at things like this. Um, once again, if you wanna change something, time it. Here we're putting, um, putting free lap cones, 10 meter fly through wickets, and the wickets are up right now. These are actually six inch wickets. To me, that's just beautiful. I hope you're seeing this without being all choppy. I mean, I could watch that shit all day long. Okay, competition changes things too. Here we're gonna do competition wickets where guys are racing each other. We're not timing. That's fun stuff. Um, here we're competing. And this is interesting because not a big run in because we're only going five feet. And the guys have to really go piston-like with the legs. I like it. Hey, we got it going. There we go. Fun stuff. We try to have fun as much as possible. Here we're going some hip mobility things. Everybody does this, but I would like to think that my kids do it with more focus. And that's what, you know, we're not just doing stuff. And we do so little that I'm always telling my guys that, that we have to really stay focused or else this shit's not going to work. Uh, this is something that's weird to what we do. We, we started doing this 21 years ago. And uh, we'll, we'll do a real fast, uh, large range of motion leg swing. And our foot that's doing the swing will actually scoot a little bit on the ground coming forward and back. So just a little bit of a scoot and it's uh, uh, getting a little friction going. That's what it looks like. We go until we get tired, which is probably about, I think he goes about nine seconds. And he's just freaking worn out after nine seconds. I've had people say, what in the F does that do? And I, I don't know, it just passes the eye test for me.
Uh, we'll do block starts in uh, X Factor days. Why not? You know, sometimes what we'll do is like four stations, um, and one of our stations will be block work. Notice he's not in spikes. Um, cat jumps. Um, I, I believe the Russians call these altitude jumps, but I actually beat the Russians on this because in 1964, I was five years old and I threw a cat off of a roof and it stuck the landing and then run like, ran like 100 miles an hour. And so from then on, I called them cat jumps. Now, once you get, at first, you just have to walk off and learn how to stick a landing. By stick a landing, that means you don't cave in, you don't pop up, you don't fall down. If he's doing a 360 here, that's kind of hard to do. But you notice he absorbed all that force. And even though we started doing this a long time ago, it was Chris Corfist um, 11 years ago, uh, when I first heard him speak, for, I never no, known the guy ever. He said, whatever we can absorb, we can generate. So force absorption, uh, it, you know, gave me a, okay, this is the reason why we're doing this, guys. Force absorption. This is my grandson doing it. Anytime I get Kendrick in, a, in, in one of my presentations, I do it. That's got to be scary as shit for a three-year-old. So we'll go on, now that I've talked about speed workouts and X-Factor workouts, we're gonna talk about the programming of this stuff. The general concept is that we're gonna go two or three speed days per week and two or three off days per week. We're gonna do zero endurance training, I mean zero. Um, I used to say that we can get aerobically fit by crowding together high intensity anaerobic work. And then Brian Kula said it much uh, better than I did at TFC Chicago back in December, where he said that you can get aerobically fit by stacking together high intensity anaerobic work. And he told the story of high intensity, five second training, um, leading uh, McCaffrey to a being the number one, the winner of the conditioning test for the Carolina Panthers. So, you can become aerobically fit by doing specific training, which is so cool in my opinion, because who wants to go out and slog through six mile runs? This is one, um, now S is speed, X is X factor. Um, this is a typical school week type thing uh, where you go speed X, speed on Wednesday, X, speed, and then take the weekend off. What we do, at Plainfield North uh, in the winter is speed X, speed X. And because Friday attendance is never very good, um, we just take that day off. And I love the four day week. I think the four day week mentally and physically is very important. I think taking that Friday off gives you more benefits than doing a speed day on that Friday. That's just my opinion, I could be wrong. If you're only gonna work three days, what I would do is I would go speed all three days, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, let's say. And then I would do some X work afterwards. Now, at first you may say, well, gee, that's, that's a lot of work that you're doing, but notice that every workout is followed by an off day. Every workout's followed by an off day. So, so I think that works too. And I think you have to be flexible uh, because everybody has different schedules and all that kind of stuff. I think it's really important to reaffirm the fact that you always want to train speed when you're fresh. You don't ever train speed when you're emotionally worn out or physically worn out or sore. Um, these, these kids that have, you know, like six days a week scheduled playing three sports, they'll never have time. Just give up. Don't even worry about speed because, you know, as a parent, you're an idiot and, and yeah, it's just not ever going to work. And, you know, but if a parent says, well, we don't have anything on Sundays, I say, well, do a speed session on Monday morning then. <laughs> but you always have to train speed when you're fresh. Ooh, let's talk about the weight room. Um, this is when people get pissed at me. Um, modern day strength and conditioning, especially in the football side, is full of characters like this. And you may argue like, oh, but Oregon's so fast. They're fast. They're fast because they recruit speed. 
It's not because of anything this cat is doing. This guy has never run a race in his life. Guaranteed he's never won a race in his life. He has no track and field background. So, so Oregon is going to be fast in spite of this guy. And obviously I'm kind of, you know, I, uh, Radcliffe, Jimmy Radcliffe was a speaker for us at one of our early TFCs. And I love the guy. And, uh, and he actually improved guy's speed, you know, so I, I don't like the direction. Now the old school guys, I, I like Michael Boyle a lot. He's a friend of mine. Um, he read one of my articles and I, it was like, I was like just making fun of meatheads. And, uh, and so he flew me out to talk to his, his meatheads in Boston. And, um, and he heard me talk and, and it was supposedly one thing that just totally flipped his switch. I said, the fastest thing we can do in a weight room is move the bar two meters per second. And it's not very safe. When we sprint, we're moving our entire body 10 meters a second. It is critical that we train the body to run fast. And so he said, for 30 years, I patiently awaited at the train station, hoping my ship would come in. Well, it's kind of cool. I, I was his ship, you know, that, that I brought something to him. So he's been training. He, he trains a hell of a lot of uh, hockey guys. And um, he trains them all with high velocity sprinting. They, they run in, they free, I don't think they free lap. I think they do Brower. But whatever they do, they're running 10 meter flies. Um, it's important to note that size never creates speed. I don't know this guy. I've never seen his face, but even though I'm 61 and slow, I might be able to beat him in a race. I guarantee that this is not functional mass here. This is, the, and you say, well, we, we don't bodybuild though. That's BS because why do you have mirrors in your weight room if you're not bodybuilders? I mean, bodybuilding, you just cannot separate bodybuilding from weightlifting, in my opinion. Now, as a coach, you can do things, but in the kid's mind, the thing that they're thinking about as they lift weights is getting big, and getting big will, big will never create speed. It's a powerful thing. Uh, my son, Alec, um, um, is a great hurdle coach, and um, he's, he coached the uh, state champion and record holder that ran 1359 named Travis Anderson. But here, this is Craig James, who I don't think he, he hurdled until he's a senior. And he was a good football player. And he got, I think, third in the state in the highs. And this is him running in the state championships. And he's in the white and orange. Um, so now he plays for the Philadelphia Eagles. And he came back for a, um, um, you know, hanging out at a workout, a track workout. And one of the track teams, the track kids on Alex's team, um, is, is going to play college football. And Craig James had some advice for him. Craig said, the best piece of advice I can give you is don't let them take away your speed. As soon as you get there, they will try to get you to pack on the weight and live in the weight room. You know, I hearken back to the picture of the Oregon guy. You know, they, they're, they're going to want to pack the weight on you. He says, my biggest mistake was living in the weight room and not sprinting. This is an NFL football player. And then he said, I have never been as fast as I was in high school. So, you know, this is just sad to me. I mean, because his speed is probably his greatest attribute. Obviously, you need, a, you need body armor to play football at a high level and to you know, to be durable enough to withstand NFL contact and all that kind of stuff. But, but the whole idea that we're going to live in a weight room and pretend that it's going to be, you know, getting us faster is BS. The myth is that stronger always makes us faster. I do agree that fast people are strong. And I do believe that I'll mention in a minute that there are certain things in the weight room that might really produce high results. But it's important to note that speed and plyometric training is really different than anything that you do in the weight room. Franz Bosch said, the stronger you are against heavy resistance, the less explosive you will become. What I try to tell uh, weight room people is it's fine to lift weights. 
but don't plant beans and grow corn. These guys here are strong. Um, they have great endurance or competitive, all that stuff, but rowing does absolutely nothing for your speed. And this guy here is strong, you know, swimming is hard, um, great endurance, but I've never met a swimmer who is fast. Just never have. I mean, you don't plant beans and grow corn. And the same way I feel about this. Like, is this guy a great athlete? No, I totally respect him. Probably kicked my ass, you know? But, but we are not talking about what he's doing right here as being something that's going to allow him to run a 1031 in the 100. It just doesn't happen that way. Uh, I know some really good coaches who do this, and I don't. We do not push sleds. Um, I think it confuses the nervous system. People say, well, isn't this position like the perfect position for acceleration? And what I say is the thing that makes my guy so good at accelerating is we accelerate often. That acceleration itself improves acceleration. And a focus on max speed and the central nervous system's production of max speed will also produce great acceleration technique. So I just get by without this stuff. The, uh, we don't pull sleds either. Um, I've always believed they're too slow. Brian Kula is changing my mind on a lot of things. I know McCaffrey um, pulled things 10% body weight. Uh, I saw, um, saw somebody on the internet on Twitter the other day. They were doing bounding, uh, pulling 8% body weight. And I'm like, Okay, I mean, if you were going to pull something, you, you don't pull anything heavy. You know, just like we don't run against the wind. We never, I mean, anybody that you see using a parachute for speed training, that's just not a very smart guy. I mean, it's just, I don't get that. Okay, this is important. I'm not anti-strength. I am not anti-weight room. However, I feel like sprinting is the most underrated strength builder in the world. And, and I mean, I just, I've seen it. I just totally believe that. Good sprinters are typically strong. They're naturally strong. They're not artificially strong. I think artificial strength leads to clunky bodies a lot of times. If somebody would have taken my gangly 170 pound body as a junior in high school and built me up big and strong, it would not have made me any faster because I would have gotten clunky. Weight training can definitely be an accessory to speed training, um, but it should not be the focus. There's no question that there are things in the weight room, especially for a weak athlete, that can really help them become better, generally speaking, athletically. But it should never be like, we're going to lift weights every day and never sprint, and we're going to get fast. You know, that, that just too much of that out there. Um, nothing I witness in the weight room is a KPI of speed. I mean, I've said this before, but if you take the best four cleaners, they are not the fastest four kids in the school. The best four deadlifters, the best four squatters, the best four. No, I mean, you could probably take the four kids with the highest vertical jump and make a pretty good sprint team out of them, but, but not anything in the weight room. Oh, here's Brian Kula. He actually... Uh, gets his own uh, section here. Everything I do is pertinent to track. All my speed work is with a track coach. All my lifting is with a track coach. When I read this, I was like, I have got to meet his track coach. And he's got to speak at the next TFC. And sure enough, he did. As a matter of fact, he spoke at two TFCs. So, um, so yeah, this is pretty important stuff. So I want to know what in the hell is uh, lifting like a track athlete? So Brian told me to read this, and I did. Um, uh, I believed uh, Barry Ross to definitely be, I mean, um, if, if there was a weight room guy who fed the cats, it'd be Barry Ross. His reps were very low, typically two or three reps, uh, very intense, typically heavy weight. Um, he never wanted today to ruin tomorrow. It's a feed the cats pillar. So uh, when I asked Brian Kulo, if I did one thing in the weight room, what would it be? Well, he got all excited and said, okay, you do three sets of concentric deadlift, 
you pull it, drop it, pull it, drop it. And I was like, oh, okay, so without an eccentric, you're not getting sore, right? He goes, oh, you're not getting sore at all. You could do it like the day before a meet. So we're all excited and everything. And he said, and then right afterwards, you superset it with some type of plyometric. I said, like any plyometric? He goes, yeah, yeah, it's hurdle hops or whatever. And then you sit their ass down for five minutes and let the ATP all come back. And I said, well, how does McCaffrey like that? He goes, he hates it. He hates it. You know, because Charlie Francis said 90% of his work with elite athletes was holding them back. Not, not like trying to get them to do work. It's holding them back. So anyway, this is cool stuff. And when you read the book, it's, uh, it makes sense. I believe Allison Felix ran a world record time two days after doing that exact workout. You know, so, you know, I'm not saying the workout led to the world record, but the workout definitely did not ruin her performance. So, like I said, with Barry Ross, what I learned is two to three reps uh, trains for power. You do heavy weight. Plyometrics is cool. Lots of rest. Don't burn the steak. Um, my recommendation is just repeating myself. Lift two or three times a week after sprinting. Never lift before sprinting. Um, heavy and low reps. Stay general. Um, I, you know, I would agree. Do the very Ross deadlift stuff. You know, it's not going to hurt. You know, it's not going to hurt you at all. Um, the reason why some people think I'm anti weights is because I really don't like my guys having a secondary recovery issue in the season. I don't like it when my guys are slow and I say, why are you slow? And you know, oh, I squatted yesterday. I hate that. Why? Running is hard enough. Why do you want um, another recovery issue? So, so yeah, if you can, if you could lift weights and not be sore the next day because it's concentric or isometric, have at it. That's fine. Remember that if you have more than three priorities, you don't have any priorities. So you cannot be like, oh, we're going to sprint. We're going to do endurance and we're going to do weights. That means you have no priorities. Let's talk about mechanics. We're going to get tall. We're going to cross the hips with the hand and we want the foot high and in front of the body. I often say you want to look like Carl. I get all this crap from Stuart McMillan about how he shouldn't be trying to change running mechanics, blah, blah, blah. Well, Stuart's never coached high school track. So shut up, Stu. Um, so uh, I want everybody to look like Carl. I've been told that all my guys look the same when they run. And that's a, that's a cool thing. I got this from, uh, I spoke in England and, and Ireland five times in September. And Jonas Dodu was my, my uh, host there. And um, he put this out. I like this. And I haven't seen it very often. But if you note the foot on the, okay, the guy in the, on the right with the blue, that's really what you want to be. He has a bigger split between his femurs, maybe 115 degrees, and the foot is more underneath the knee. He's also more upright and he's taller, you know? So, um, uh, so you want to be like the guy on the right. Um, all great runners have similarities. Uh, everything we do here, we're just doing a skips and with a skips, obviously there's a rhythm -y type thing going on, but we're also being real tall. Um, getting up on our toes, we uh, uh, hands crossing the hips, we have a foot underneath the knee, um, big femur uh, uh, split going on. So everything we do is, is trying to reinforce those things. Here's Marcellus, uh, big split. If you bisect the angle, the arrow goes out underneath his foot. We're going to show some things now. This is, this is actually the second best sprinter in Illinois last year. He ran like a 1048. And, uh, Check out his backside mechanics. It's absolutely horrific. Um, he could be so much better. And, you know, if you bisect that angle, it's not very good. You know, that, that arrow goes right underneath his crotch. Um, he is what Jonas Dodu says. He's showing his spikes to Jesus. That's when you have really bad running mechanics. And by the way, this happens to guys who run too much as kids. If you sign your kids up for soccer when they're three years old and that's all they have ever done is half-ass running and never sprinted, they might have really bad backside mechanics. More important than just seeing this, though, is how do you correct it? 
And what everybody wants to do is correct it by saying, hey, you're too long in the back. <laughs> Cueing this does not fix anything. This is a habit that must be changed. So what I would suggest is fast march, where you march fast. There's no way to march with being big in the back. You will never show your spike plate to Jesus if you are fast marching. So you fast march to start, and then you fast march over wickets. And then you sprint over short wickets that make you have that piston-like stuff. And it's almost like a sprinting is really marching. It's done really fast. So you do that. And then you bring out the video camera, your iPhone. And you sprint, like I showed you earlier, over six-foot wickets. And you see if it comes back. And you have them come over and you show them the video. And you don't say anything. Let them talk to you. And... And they'll say like, oh, God, look, coach, uh, it's, it's come back. I said, okay, we can't go over wickets anymore. We got to go back to fast march. So you just continue. Basically, you're trying to break a habit and start a new one. Um, you can't, yeah. Cueing is probably one of the dumbest things, you know, like, get your knees up. No, you got to, we are what we do. You know, we can't just get our knees up. Yeah, if, if it returns, you got to go right back to the drawing board and you just got to stay with it. It's not going to be easy. This is that 10 or 11 year old from Louisiana. Um, he looks like he could be a good athlete. The only thing I could say about this picture looks great. Um, except for I, I like the foot out in front a little bit more, you know, I, it's a little bit tucked underneath the hamstring. I would like that front foot under the knee. Now we're starting to see problems. Hopefully after what we just talked about, you know, the problem here, uh, if I was in a classroom, I would have all of you in chorus saying, yeah, he's showing the spikes to Jesus. That's not good. And then we have a collapse. This is a, a lack of stiffness, a lack of strength, but strength and stiffness are kind of two different things. Um, so a lot of the X factor stuff we do is really meant to, uh, to increase our stiffness and decrease our collapse. We do not want to collapse the hips. He's a little collapse of the hips or the knee or the ankle. We don't want to bleed out energy at any of those joints. So one of the reasons that we stay tall and everything we do, stay tall, stay tall, is that staying tall prevents, is at least trying to remember that you don't want to collapse. One of my favorite pictures of Marcellus, um, I took this at the state meet last year and it shows just incredible stiffness. And he also had this great timing with his arm and, uh, going down at the exact time that his plant was going down. Um, you see a spike plate and he's not showing it to Jesus. Uh, another thing that you're seeing here is that on plant, you should have your knee at least to your, your plant knee. Um, your swing knee, if it's 10 or 12 inches past your plant knee, you are a fast guy. So, uh, so this is a real good picture of stiffness and no collapse. Here's some collapse stuff coming from my good friend, Ken Clark. Ken Clark is a TFC insider, track football consortium. Um, the guy on the left is a competitive sprinter. He's good. You know, you can, you can tell that stiffness. You can see the knee past the knee on plant. That's really good. The guy in the middle sucks, you know, terrible posture. Um, his knee is not as far past the knee. Um, and there's collapse. You see the collapse in the hip and in the knee. Collapse is not good. And then probably one of the ugliest pictures I've ever seen is this uh, terrible collapse at the hips. Um, here, <laughs> the frontal plane collapse. It should be the opposite of that. There, her waistband, it looks like a her, I don't know, maybe it's a bad looking he, but but that waistband should be the opposite. That, uh, that leg on our right, or I guess it's her right, his right, uh, should be higher than the waistband on the plant leg. And I'll show you some pictures here. Actually, it's a video. Marcel here is, is wearing a white t-shirt, which allows you to see this really cool um, oscillation between, uh, with the shoulders. The shoulders go up and down maybe by an inch. And then also you can see his waist is going up and down by about an inch.
it was pretty fast to really see what was going on, but I can show you here what I mean. Okay. Okay, you see on our right how his hip is hiked up higher and his shoulder on our right side, his left, is up high. One of the ways he gets that done is really pushing his elbow on the backswing to the sky. Carl Lewis, who was another TFC speaker, talked often about driving the elbow to the sky. When that happens, that shoulder gets hiked up a little bit. It brings the hip with it. I, I love it. Now, if it works here, we should be able to see the other side. Not quite as much. There it is. There it is. So, so now the other shoulder is up and that hip is hiked. And then here is back the other way. That shoulder comes way up on that side. And also check out his stiffness of his plant leg. There's not much collapse there. He is absolutely the most efficient um, sprinter I've ever seen. Because like I say, he's 5'6", 149. This year at the age of 17, run for Purdue. It is an oversized track, but he ran 2101 um, indoors. He got fourth in the 200. He got third in the 60 um, as a 17-year-old uh, at Purdue in the Big Ten. So let's, let's check out another one here. Uh, Noah Lyles, you can see the hip hike here. Um, it's important, and we're going to talk about this in a second. One of the things that allows that hip hike, that, that waist, um, to come up is the glute med on the plant side. That glute med is a really important muscle that this all comes from Corpus. This is a really important muscle, and I'm going to teach you something about how to develop that muscle here in a minute. But is the contraction of that glute med that actually allows the other side of the hip to hike upward. Uh, Bolt showing some shoulder and hip hike here. Um, you also see the incredible stiffness of his plant leg. There's no leakage there from elbow, knee, or hip. Um, the glute med is contracting, allowing that hip to hike up. He's also using his shoulder and his elbow to the sky to hike up. So what we would see is like the back and forth shoulder, hip, bam, bam. So this gets me excited because it's so beautiful. Let's talk about dopamine. Um, we're getting close to the end here, and then we'll take questions. Um, but I think you cannot talk about sprinting. And if I'm, once again, I'm talking to Liam Kennedy. I said, I know you live in freaking Philadelphia and it sucks, but once you get daylight, once you get light, you need to be out in the sun as much as possible. There's a reason why California, Texas, Georgia, and Florida has 90% of the best sprinters in the country. And it's not coaching. I guarantee it's not coaching in Florida. That, that, that state's messed up in all ways. But anyway, the, uh, it's the dopamine, guys. I mean, it's really hard to be super fast in cloudy states. And if you are super fast, you must be doing something right. There's no way that those, uh, those uh, 40 low 4x1 four teams in uh, Texas would run that if they were running in, the, in Chicago. There's no way. No way. I mean, dopamine is really important. So I wrote this article that's uh, – I, I still really like all my articles, obviously, but this is a good article. But high dopamine um, creates an excitatory effect on motor neurons. High dopamine levels m literally will make you faster. And it also has an excitatory effect on anybody holding your blocks. It's one of my favorite pictures there that I took. I take pictures at meets. High dopamine also creates a reckless confidence, which is not always uh, easy to live with, but sprinters need reckless confidence. It kills me. Distance coaches are constantly trying to tamp down the confidence levels of sprinters. They just don't understand. And, you, you know, just because they aren't a cat, you know, it doesn't mean you try to take the cat out of a sprinter. So those two things are really important. So how do you increase dopamine? Sunshine. Sleep. Well, if, if we're living in a cloudy state, at least we can get sleep. Uh, by the way, sleep is really important, important for testosterone as well. To dopamine and testosterone is pretty damn important. And here's the cool thing too. I think as coaches, we need to hear this, that winning gives us a shot of dopamine. Many of your kids will never win a race, but by record, rank, publish, they can get that shot of dopamine in a practice situation. 
we must constantly be giving kids boxes that they can check off, uh, and things that they can accomplish, things they feel good about. It always has to be authentic. It cannot be like fake praise, like, hey, good job, good job. Um, and no, it, it needs to be like, holy shit, you just ran the fastest time you've ever run your life. Now, that's a major shot of dopamine. Another thing that I don't think you can do without is, uh, well, at least I couldn't, is Reflexive Performance Reset. The online course for about 300 bucks is really good. Um, I, I think probably the in-person course is better, uh, but we're living in COVID-19 times, so in-person may not be very common for a while. But uh, yeah, RPR is, is really important, I think, to a sprint group. Um, you know, I, I don't know if it's the low dose or the RPR, to tell you the truth, but we just don't have injuries anymore. When our season ended early, uh, we had 38 sprinters, and all 38 were 100% healthy. All 38, 100% healthy. And, you know, people say, oh, how could that happen with all that sprinting you do and the CNS toil? And Well, remember, our doses are low, um, but RPR is also part of our program. So um, some people like to take a screenshot of this. Um, this is Feed the Cats programming. Um, moderate exercise never leads to high performance. I stole that from Bowerman from Oregon, you know, but yet every freaking coach in the world basically does moderate exercise in practice because they are tired all the time and they just yell for effort, more effort, more effort. And they, yeah, you've got to have freaky exercise to lead to freaky performance. Sprinting should replace running in your program. So Liam Kennedy, you're trying to be the fastest guy you can run. You got to do everything. You got to keep pounding that post in the same direction. That sprint, sprint, sprint. You never let today ruin tomorrow. You never burn the stake. Tired is the enemy, not the goal. You don't hear that very much. Uh, it makes a lot of sense to say we want racehorses, not workhorses. So when people act like effort is the key to all things athletic, I'm like, no, it's not. Shut up. I'd rather be 100% healthy and 80% in shape than the other way around. You want to get aerobically fit by crowding together anaerobic work. Why do I have such an affliction for aerobic focused work? Well, it simply makes you slower. It confuses the CNS, and I don't like that. Plus, it's no fun. Aerobic focus interferes with maintaining, maintaining and increasing speed. You want to eliminate conditioning from your vocabulary. Conditioning, I tell the whole SNC community, I wish that their job was not strength and conditioning. I wish their job was speed and power. It would have been so much better to be speed and power coaches and not strength and conditioning. You want to practice fast and intense. You don't want to practice long and hard. You want to find the 20% that really matters. You got to, you got to come up with your priorities. And you, you need to eliminate all the crap that you do. You want to do less and achieve more. You will automatically improve your quality when you do that. And then you have to accept the foundation of high performance is not hard work. It's actually the opposite of hard work. It's rest, recovery, and asleep. Um, you know, the, I guess this is why Feed the Cats is so revolutionary, is because all of this is swimming upstream. You know, but of course, Corfus tells me all the time that only dead fish go with the current. So, um, so yeah, you, you need you need to be thinking. You know, get get outside the lines, um, err on the side of not burning the state, keeping kids happy and healthy, and all those good things. I'll end with this. Um, I, obviously, as a coach, I used to be a big goal person. Uh, but then I read Chop Wood, Carry Water. If you haven't read it, you need to read it. Man, essentialism. Um, but he says, uh, Josh Metcalf says, you need to burn your goals. Get rid of them. And instead, be on a daily mission. When you're on a daily mission, you never have the ups and downs. You don't, you know, like, oh, you don't screw up in a performance or have a bad game and then go on three-day you know depression or something um, no you're just you want to be great every day and then here's the key you surrender to the outcome by surrendering to the outcome 
A lot of people think what this does is protect you from, from the depression of failure. And it's not that at all. You surrender to the outcome because you perform better when you say, fuck it. I'm just going to go after it. The person you want beside you in battle is the guy who has surrendered to the outcome and surrendered to the fact that you might die. That guy that just said, yeah, I can picture this guy in battle as a warrior. This guy is going to be a maniac because he doesn't care anymore. He's just going to let it rip. And that's the way the best athletes do it. I leave my contact information here. I'm pretty good at, at uh, I'm really good at answering people. Um, email, phone, you know, I Googled myself the other day and my phone number is on the internet at about a hundred different places. I want to plug the consortium and reflexive performance and follow me on Twitter and all that kind of stuff. But, um, but I'm, I'm there, you know, I, uh, I'm retired now. Of course, we're all retired for the next couple of months probably, but um, thank you for coming.